Okay, before we get into kind of a full-scale discussion of what wave functions really are, um, let's just take a step back and just consider kind of like the, the philosophy of physics. Um, and by that, I mean basically like what is the fundamental question that physics is trying to answer? And if we think about like, for example, Newtonian mechanics or classical electrodynamics, in either case, the, the, the question comes down to given our knowledge of, for example, where a particle is right now and how its position is changing, where will it be in the future? Or given the amount of charge a particle has and some other nearby charges, what will happen to that charge at later times? And really that's what the basic idea of this wave function is, except instead of using Newton's laws or Maxwell's equations to calculate what will happen in the future, if we know what this wave function is, we can use the laws of quantum physics to estimate or, or predict what will happen to that thing in the future. So, very specifically, this wave function encapsulates basically everything we ever need to know about a particle as long as we know something about the environment that it's in. And again, when I say the, the philosophy of physics, that's really what it comes down to. Given what we know about the part of uh, something and what we know about the things it's interacting with, it allows us to predict exactly what will happen in the future. So the only difference is this uses a weird set of rules, much stranger than Newton's or, or maybe not quite, or it's the, the, the laws of electrodynamics are a little bit stranger than Newton's, but not nearly as strange as quantum physics. But the whole point is that it allows us to predict the future of something if we know the current state of it. And let's be a little bit more precise now. So, as we know, uh, Schrodinger was one of the, 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 the architects of what we now understand to be, well, wave mechanics of quantum physics. And, and that's, that's a loaded phrase, so I kind of don't want to unload it right now. But, in short, we have seen evidence that, that objects have both wave and particle-like behaviors. And that's what this basically describes. It, it tells us something about the wave and the particle-like nature of, of a thing that we're looking at, whether it's an electron or an atom or a neutrino, whatever it might be. And then if we tell it also what, what, the, uh, what the environment that it's in is currently looking like, we can calculate for all future times what the different possibilities of measuring it might be. So, let's get a little more concrete now. Specifically, when Schrodinger introduced his equation, he introduced something that he wrote as psi of x and t, and his direct uh, interpretation of this, or what, what he said it, it represents, is the probability of finding a particle at a given point x and a given time t. And I'll write that up here. Uh, I'll, I'll write it up and I'm going to change it. But psi of x and t represents the probability of finding a particle at that point, or at the position x and time t. So we're, we're, I'm kind of even like making a, a pretty big leap here, and I'm, I'm claiming that we can represent the, all the information that we need to know about something, and, and I say particle here, but it can be any sort of a, a quantum system. But think about it in terms of just simply a particle right now. We can describe everything that we need to know about that particle by a mathematical function. And specifically, that mathematical function tells us at least something about the probability of finding that particle. Now, the correction that we need to make, and I told you this was incomplete here, the correction we need to make is it's not actually just that function psi of x and t. So it's not like this is, this is the probability turns out that it's actually that thing squared. And now we get to a bit of an interesting question, because if you recall in our last lecture, when we introduced the, the Schrodinger equation, the left-hand side had the imaginary uh, uh, letter i in it, the square root of negative 1. The right-hand side was purely, it, was, it didn't have any mention of um, imaginary numbers. So I made the bold claim that something about psi has to, has to be imaginary that you can't have an imaginary left-hand side and a real right-hand side. So, we already know that 
this is very likely going to have both a real and an imaginary com a component. So uh, if you have seen anything about complex variables in the past, you know that when you square a complex variable, you have to do something a little bit different to square it. You have to put absolute magnitudes around it. And, and I'll describe in a moment exactly what I mean by that. But this is directly what Schrodinger had postulated. That if you know based on some complex valued function, psi of, based on variables x and time, when you square that function in the proper manner, it will tell you directly what the probability of finding that particle at that position and time are. And that, that's just a, a really bold statement in itself. So we can now create a function that if you know that function, we all of a sudden know exactly how probable that particle is to be anywhere, basically. But we need to modify that just a little bit. So this is why we had an entire lecture basically on probability theory, because we're now going to get a little bit more precise about what it means to have a probability of, of finding a particle at a certain point. So, uh, first of all, let's just talk about like some examples of what this might look like here. Okay, so let's start with basically some really easy examples and we'll build up from that. So, what I've drawn here is, is simply just a one-dimensional axis. Uh, we'll, we're labeling it X and we're going to consider only a single instant of time. So, this very clearly can depend on time, but I'm going to pause time right now and only describe the spatial extent of this. So first of all, let's say that we have um, a, 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 a function psi that simply looks like a bell curve or a normal curve. Now, the proper name for this is, of course, a Gaussian, and it's a very well-defined mathematical function, but it looks something like this. And it, typically, the, the weird thing is that, like, when you have statistical, like, well, I, I'll, I'll avoid the word I was going to use, when you have st statistical situations, Oftentimes, the, the results of those, those statistics obey exactly a curve like this. It's a weird law of nature. Um, but So let's say that this red curve indicates psi of x. And again, I'm only indicating that the, the instant paused at a certain time. Um, by the way, uh, you're going to see me write, and this just as an aside, you're going to see me write big psi, that's capital psi, and typically we think of that as a function of both space and time. And you'll also see me write little psi, or actually that's kind of a poorly drawn psi there. Um, you'll see me write little psi, which basically doesn't have those the, the hat and the feet. And typically we think of that as strictly just that wave function at a specific time. So, and I, I slip into this kind of, it's just after doing this so long, it's kind of ingrained that if you don't see the hat and the feet, then you know it's just a spatially dependent function. Okay, so just as an aside, notice that I did that there and I'm, I'm pointing that out. I, I won't point that out again. So if the wave function simply looks like that, psi of x and t, the probability of finding the particle at a given point x will just be whatever that is squared. So you just kind of take the magnitude and it'll look like that. And that would indicate how likely the particle is to be anywhere. So, I mean, it, it's a really easy example here because at no point does it ever go negative. We're assuming it's just real valued everywhere. Um, those are things that we're going to relax here in a moment. But just as a very basic example, there's a slight difference between what that wave function looks like and that actual measurable probability of where that particle would be. And pretty clearly in this case, the most likely position to find that particle, if this postulate is true, you're most likely to find that particle right at the center of that peak. And so I'm going to write this here as the expected position or the most likely position. And if you recall last time, the, let, the, the way that we wrote that was the expectation value of x. If you were to measure that particle anywhere, the most likely point x that it would be is right there. So that's directly what that means. Now, this will get a little more complicated as we move on. But, uh, and then you can also measure, for example, the spread of this, the width of that, 
is what we call the standard deviation, or more specifically, the variance. So that variance thing there is going to look like this. We call that sigma squared. So we have given our wave function psi, and then therefore our probability, psi squared, if you knew the like analytical form of that function, you can very easily calculate what the most likely place that particle would be, where the, where the function uh, spikes, and how likely it would be to be away from that most likely position, sigma squared, or you take the square root, that's the, the standard deviation. I wasn't trying to flip you off there, but I just did. Anyway, um, okay, so let's do another example, and this is gonna look a little bit different here. So now what I've drawn, and again, I'm indicating strictly just psi of x. Now we have a function that goes positive and negative. And notice, by the way, of all of the functions I'm going to draw, if you extend it out to negative and positive infinity, one of our rules is that it has to approach zero. It's, um, it, I'll get a little more technical th about that in a moment. But this is, a, this is an example of a type of function that is strictly forbidden by classical probability theory. Because if it approaches, let's say, positive a half and then negative a half, a, a, a negative value just is nonsensical in talking about probabilities. But that's why this wave function must be squared in order to actually describe a probability. So if we square that function, it will now look something like this. It will have a big hump, and then when you square a negative, of course, you get a positive. And it kind of looks like an upside down butt, but it is what it is. So this is our wave function squared, or our actual probability distribution now. And now this becomes our first instant that things are going to get weird. That it's entirely possible, and, and I guarantee in one of our first examples that we're going to work, we're going to have a wave, uh, uh, we're going to have a particle whose wave function is described by exactly this curve here. And so the probability of finding that particle at a, any point x now has two separate kind of lobes. It's equally likely to find that particle on the left-hand side of the center point and the right-hand side. So, I posit this to you. What is the expectation value of that particle given that its probability distribution is what I tried to draw um, a, a symmetric about that center point. So where is that expectation value x here? Now, hopefully you can see if it's equally likely to be on the left side of that, of that thing, right, of that point right there and the right side, that really if it's equally likely to be on either side, the expectation value is going to be right there. The most, the, the, the average value, if you took many measurements of where that particle would be, if it's represented by that red wave function, everything to the left will cancel out everything on the right, and the expectation value for finding that particle anywhere is centered right there. But here's something strange. What is the actual probability of finding that particle at that point? Now, remember, if that wave function looks like this, it's kind of like a, this would be like a negative sine curve is what that is, by the way. Um, I could have drawn it bottom and up, whatever, but um, at the point where it crosses zero is exactly where the expectation value is. And this is weird. This blue curve here is exactly equal to zero where the particle is expected to be. And, and so this brings up some very weird questions. But we have an example of a case where the expectation value is not, in fact, a possible result. If you measure the particle to be anywhere, the only point where there's a 0% chance it will be is exactly the center of this. So now we can answer, or, or, or now it brings up a case of having two different distinctly separate possibilities. It will either be to the left or to the right of that. 
and I don't want to go too much further with this train of thought, but we can now start to build up the idea of uh, the measurements may not necessarily match the most likely values. So let's, let's do one more example here kind of based on this here. Um, and I will actually kind of represent the formula for it below. Okay, let, let's try this third one again. I had to, uh, my artwork got away from me, so I, I, I'm redoing this one here. Um, so the, the third example I want to show here is, let's consider, again, the same axis, x. Now, to be clear, x is a real number, uh, and that's, we, we consider that space only has real components. I say that because I'll actually give an analytical form of, of the function psi here. So let's imagine that psi is equal to, or psi of x, we'll say, is equal to e to the i x times some constant. I'll just write it e to the i x. Now, those of you who have not seen x, uh, 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 this thing e to the i x, it is a like wonderfully amazing mathematical thing that Euler was famous for, for uh, realizing what this actually stood for. And I don't want to prove this, but it's, it's absolutely something you should like look up at some point in your life. Um, this stands for cosine of x plus i sine of x. Um, and by the way, um, electrical engineers or, or engineers in general use this basically more than they use like even sines and cosines. It's, it turns out it's actually much easier to talk about cosine and sine functions in terms of complex exponentials. If you get further on in, in quantum field theory, for example, or, or uh, talking about like literally like the earliest moments of the universe, this type of function is just, it's, it's almost the single most important function that you use. So get used to using this e to the i x or e to the i something, um, and just uh, instinctively just think of it in your head as a cosine that's real and a sine that's imaginary. So the way that I'm going to draw this, and actually I think it might be helpful to draw the imaginary part in green, or write it in green. So we have i sine x. And the reason why I'm doing that is now when we graph this function, it's going to have both real and imaginary components at every point. Except for certain points where like uh, cosine of x might be zero, or sine x might be zero. So this function is going to look like this. I'll draw the real part in red. So the cosine is going to look like this. And then I will draw the imaginary part in green and notice that it's offset by 90 degrees or pi over two. So in this case here, it's going to look like this. <laughs> this is why my artwork gets away from me. Uh, it does not look like that. Come on. Um, all right, so it's going to Go up, it's going to reach a peak there where the red one hits zero. It's going to hit zero there. That's as good as I can possibly do here. <laughs> um, basically, all you have to do is like click and drag the red one and shift it over by pi over two on the x-axis. So anyway, it looks something like that at least. Now, the reason why I mention this is that if you want to now draw the blue line, not only does the, the real part get negative at some point, and we know how to deal with that, but we have to also include the green part, which is the imaginary component. So what we need to do specifically now is we're going to graph psi of x squared but we specifically calculate that by taking psi of x and the complex conjugate, which I'm gonna write like that. The complex conjugate of psi times psi itself. Now, if you haven't heard that word before, the complex conjugate, all you do is you flip, it, every time you see an i, you turn it to a negative i. So what we're going to do specifically, and, and I don't want to go too much deeper in the analytical side of this example, but we're going to take at all points the cosine plus i sine of x and multiply it by the cosine minus i sine of x. The whole reason why we do this, and, and we're going to see more examples later on, but 
by taking the complex conjugate times the function itself, you're guaranteed to get a real valued positive answer. So it's real and it's positive. Now in this case here, what that's going to look like on this axis, if you take the red part and square it and add it to the green part that's squared, turns out, and, and I don't want to give away the fun here, but there's a fun proof that shows that at all points it's going to be the same value, and that value is exactly a half. So it's a constant value of a half everywhere. Um, it's, the, the, the rationale is cosine squared plus sine squared always gives you an answer of a half, no matter where you calculate that at. So we have the possibility of strictly just positive real functions in red, or the top one, that give you a probability distribution. You can have positive or negative real functions, and we still have a very well-defined way of calculating a squared or the probability there. And we can even have imaginary functions that we can still take that psi function and find a probability by complex conjugate squaring it, or, or complex squaring. If you, there's a term, I, I forget what it is. Um, so these are just a couple introductions to how we can take a, a already known function psi and use it to calculate a likelihood of finding a particle somewhere. And by the way, last note with this one, if you have a probability distribution that's basically constant everywhere, that means that we don't really know anything about the, the particle, that it's equally likely to be everywhere. And in this case, this turns out to be a disallowed function for, for reasons that we'll get into later. Um, okay, so this is just a, a couple examples of, of some graphical analysis of taking a function psi and turning it into a likelihood of finding a particle. Um, but let's relate this back to some of the rules of, of classical probability theory and see how we can actually calculate this in a, in a more mathematical sense.